There's bioelectrical events, there's biomechanical events, there's biochemical events. All those things are happening at the same time. But what's really important to ask is what is each layer doing and what does each layer give us the opportunity to do? I, I would argue that the genome is actually not the software. I, th I think what the genome does is actually nail down the hardware. I think the genome tells every single cell what proteins it gets to have. And so from that perspective, what the genome is giving you is a specification of the lowest level hardware. You can do a lot by manipulating the hardware, but when you're on your laptop and you want to switch from Microsoft Word to Photoshop, you don't get out your soldering iron and start rewiring because making system level changes by manipulating things at the lowest level of your machine of the, of the hardware is super hard. And that's not how evolution does it. What one of the nice things that this bioelectrical level of control gives you is it actually gives you control over some of the really important physiological software that deals with large scale concepts like the size of certain organs, the shape of certain organs, the positioning, how many heads do you have? And therefore, when you interact with that layer, you get to program top down. It's almost as if you were working in a higher level language that doesn't require you to understand, well, gee, you know, I'm programming on this thing of copper and silicon and, and, and aluminum and God knows what else is in there. You don't need to know all of that because you have access to these higher level controls. Welcome to the first Demystifying Science podcast of the new year. I am very, very excited to be here with Dr. Michael Levin, whom has been brought to our attention by you guys, by uh, some of our listeners who posted his TED Talk. It was really exciting to see that Dr. Levin had been building a framework for development that didn't rely on typical chemical signaling. So he has this bioelectric network conception of development which is fascinating because it's both primitive and sophisticated at the same time. He was also in the news this year for these Xenobots, and uh, there's plenty of podcasts and other YouTube shows about that stuff. Um, maybe we'll talk about it a bit today, too. But what I really wanted to get into was Dr. Levin's philosophy of the self and cognition, which I think is really interesting. Thank you for being here, Dr. Levin. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Why do you avoid the word consciousness and stick with these other terms like agency and uh, cognition uh, as opposed to the most popular word in philosophy right now, which is consciousness? Can you tell yeah, us a bit uh, about the distinction between those two ideas? And then maybe we'll get into uh, the nitty gritty of your ideas. Sure, sure. And, and um, if you don't mind, um, I just want to address one re super quick thing from, mm -hmm. from, the, from the introduction, oh, which is that... Um, you know, my, my work on bioelectricity is certainly not meant to be uh, instead of um, understanding biochemical signaling. So I'm, I'm in no way suggesting that the traditional gene regulatory networks, chemical gradients, uh, you know, bi bi biochemical pathways, I'm in no way suggesting that those things aren't important or that somehow bioelectricity will do it all by itself. So those things are Got absolutely it. like critical mechanisms. But, but um, and hopefully we can talk about that later today. I think bioelectricity has some really interesting, unique properties that make it something that uh, is, is very worthwhile to, um, to, to track in, in addition to the, you know, kind of the canonical mainstream stuff that, that um, has been going on for years. But so, so I, you know, I just want to be clear that, that I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to, um, you know, downplay any of that. So it's like, you see, um, you see those happening in parallel, like there's all these different systems uh, throughout the organism that are contributing to memory and intelligence. It's like, this is just another track that's happening. And of course, like, I guess the traditional paradigm where DNA is, you know, this, what we would say, I guess the software and the, or the genetic information is the software. And then there's this kind of machine running the body is a bit different from the way you see things, which is more uh, yeah. hierarchically yeah. dispersed, I suppose. I mean, so, so I would say it a little differently. And it, it, certainly all those things are happening simultaneously. So, so there's, there's bioelectrical events, there's biomechanical events, there's biochemical events. All those things are happening at the same time. But what's what's really important to ask is what is each layer doing, and but, but the but what it, what does each layer give us the opportunity to do? So when you target the bioelectrics, or when you target the biochemistry or the genetics, what does that allow you to do? And I think I, I would argue, and I have argued that 
um, what the genome, the genome is actually not the software. I, th I think what the genome does is actually nail down the hardware. I think the genome tells every single cell what proteins it gets to have. And so from that perspective, what the genome is, is giving you is a specification of the lowest level hardware. Mm. Now, now, as we know from, from, from working with, with computer technology, you can do a lot by manipulating the hardware. But, you know, why do we, and this is kind of a silly example I use all the time, when, you, when you're on your laptop and you want to switch from Microsoft Word to Photoshop, you don't get out your soldering iron and start rewiring. Now, why don't you do that, right? You, you, you could, and, and in the 50s, when I give a talk, I have this picture of what programming looked like in the 40s and 50s, and there's this woman, and she's literally like, like moving wires around, right? That's what reprogramming looked like. You could do that, but why don't we do that anymore? Because it's brutally difficult. Mm. Because, because making, making system-level changes by manipulating things at the lowest level of your machine, of, of the hardware, is super hard. Right, it's just it's just incredibly hard, and and that's not how evolution does it, and uh, either. And so, um, what what one thing, I, and we, we we can get into this. I think that what <clears throat> one of the nice things that this bioelectrical level of control gives you is it actually gives you control over some of the really important physiological software that deals with large scale. Uh, uh, concepts like the, the size of certain organs, the shape of certain organs, the positioning, how many heads do you have, like that, that kind of a thing. And, and therefore, when you interact with that layer, you get to program top down. It's almost as if, and, and it, 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 it's almost as if you were working in a higher level language that doesn't require you to understand, well, gee, you know, I'm programming on this thing of copper and silicon and, and, and aluminum and God knows what else is in there. You don't need to know all of that because you have access to these higher level controls. Now, I'm certainly not saying that biology it resembles the kind of computers that you and I use today, right? That's, 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 that, you know, that's for sure that, that get, that gets people very agitated when they, when they think that, um, that's being claimed. And so I'm certainly not saying that, but, but there is something very profound about um, computers in general, which is this idea of reprogrammability and the idea of separation of data from machine and the idea of having different levels of control where, where, yes, yeah, sometimes you want to go to the very lowest level and deal with the, with the, you know, what are the chips made of? And other times you don't want to know that whatsoever. You want to say, well, this is my algorithm and I want it to compute this and that, and I don't care what's underneath. Right. And so, and so that gives you a lot of power. So, so I think what um, what evolution discovered very early on, like around the time of bacterial biofilm, so really early on, is that uh, and 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 the, there's some there's some beautiful work out of uh, uh, UCSD on that. Um, I think what evolution discovered is that bioelectric networks are 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 really good at processing information. They make it really easy to do computations, to do memory, to integrate information from from across a distance to um, have reprogrammability, to have this kind of nested architecture where you have subroutines, where you can say, build an eye here, and you don't need to know how to build an eye. You just need to be able to specify that that's where the eye goes. And there are other modules underneath that, you know, do the, do the, um, do the nitty gritty work. Are those so genetic the, modules at that point? Uh, yeah, they, they involve, they involve lots of things. I they involve um, genetics, they involve biomechanics because you have to bend, mm. you know, tissues and you have to exert forces and, and of course other bioelectrics as well. Right. Um, but, but that's what I think is really kind of unique and interesting about bioelectricity. And, and we could have already guessed that because that's what the brain does, right? Why, what, you know, the, 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 the brain uses that same uh, kind of, uh, kind of architecture to exploit uh, to exploit bioelectrics to get all these cool features. Like for example, you can learn things during your lifetime. You don't need to completely uh, replace your brain every time you want to learn something new. That same hardware can can store one of numerous possible you know control um, algorithms for what what's going to happen. And this and, is uh, and and if I can interrupt you, this is sort of the place where the distinction between cognition and consciousness and the way that you prefer to use cognition becomes relevant, right? Because if you're talking about the human that's going out and learning something, there is all of this sort of self-generative material that is necessary to create the motivation to go out and to learn something. But for a cell, is it considered cognition by you simply because the instruction has to come from somewhere else to tell it what to do? Um, no, so so let's so so let me let me address that that question. Then um, what's what the what the deal with consciousness is? So so my distinction of consciousness versus cognition is not about uh, the level of it. So I'm not avoiding consciousness because I want to reserve consciousness for like a really high order, self reflective 
you know, uh, metacognition where I know what I know. And I, you know, that I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm, I actually, you know, long story short, I actually think that um, consciousness is something that goes all the way down. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm in, I'm in no way trying to reserve that for the kind of human like conscious experience that we have. I think, I think consciousness goes, goes way all the, all the way down. The distinction, the distinction I make is, is somewhat different. The thing about, the thing about um, cognition, agency, behavior, intelligence, memory, problem solving, all these nice terms that I use all the time in, in, in the work. The thing with the, about those words is that they are, they're, they're functional words. In other words, we can study them in third person. You and I can look at something. We can define this as a function of what it's doing. We can assign criteria that we um, that uh, w- w- are easy to measure. All of these things are measurable. We can agree on whether that did or didn't happen, or it happened to with the you know seventy five percent quality or whatever it's going to be. And we have theories that are where the outcome of those theories are, let's say, um, quantity, they're numbers, predictions of those theories are numbers. I can say, I think that's memory. And because I think that under those same circumstances, you've got an 80% chance that past experience is going to make this thing do X, Y, Z in the future, right? These are, these are all third person kind of objective science experiments that we can do. Consciousness, and, and, and this is a controversial view, not everybody agrees with this. I think that consciousness is unique and special in the sense that it it, it's it's really only applicable to the experience of a first person observer. It's and and this has been one one way that people who have done way more work on consciousness than I have put it is what's it? it it's the sort of what is it like to be a you know whatever. And and the thing I want to I want to say about there's a couple of things I want to say about consciousness. One is you have to be very careful because I think a lot of people who say they're studying consciousness are in fact studying correlates of consciousness. They're studying behaviors. They're studying structures. And the way you know that is if there's a couple of, there's a couple of ways you know that one is if somebody gives you a theory of consciousness, right? Let's say, let's say it has to do with a particular structure in the brain or a particular organization or some sort of um, frequency of, of, uh, of binding of, of, you know, neural activity or whatever it's going to be. Just ask yourself this question. If, if somebody gave this, this, this story to me on a piece of paper and said, this happens, this happens. If if they didn't tell me that this was meant to be a, a story about consciousness, and I read about all these events going on, would I ever in a million years have said, "Oh, that is amazing"? I can from that I can see that that wow, there must be a subject home inside there, and you know, and it's that that you know that subject will have an experience of what it's like to be. That never happens, right? Any story about consciousness, and and I'm you know pr- probably lots of people will be mad at this, but 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 to, in my experience, when somebody gives you a, an account of of where consciousness comes from. You can almost always read that account, and you can you can imagine that you you can there's there's nothing conscious about it. It's a description of some physics or some chemistry or, or both or whatever. It's it's never quite obvious why that in particular has anything to do with consciousness, other than they told you that this was supposed to be a story about consciousness. So now now some people will say right, and that's because there's nothing more to say, and the, the, there is that all there is, is uh, right are the facts of chemistry, and then the rest of it is a user illusion, and so on. So that, that I mean, that's fine. That's a that's um which makes uh, it a spiritual that, question rather than a scientific one. I think I think that's true. I think that uh, you can you very quickly run out of proper terminology because people <laughs> people will well people will often say it's an illusion, right? And you say, yeah, but illusions usually have a subject that's 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 mistaken about something, right? That's being, um, you know, confused or or whatever. So uh, any, anyway, so, so so that's so that's one. So so I think that I think that it's very very difficult to actually do experiment ex- any kind of work about consciousness. Um, I think that if we want to stick to making progress in terms of um, experiments that we can do. So this is why I, I usually talk very little about it because I think that, the, what, that what we actually make progress on are things like cognition and intelligence and behavior. I think it's very hard to make progress on actual consciousness. The other, the other way you, you know this, that there's a problem here is, is this. Imagine, imagine that some time in the future, some, some number of decades from now, we have a correct theory of consciousness. Let's say somebody cracks it and we figure it out. Okay, so now, Let's just ask ourselves. So now, so we have this correct theory, and I am looking at some particular creature in some particular weird state, uh, and I ask this theory to make a to to tell me what the prediction is, right? So, so what is it? What is the con the the content of the consciousness of this creature? And so the question is, what format 
does the answer of the theory take? What does it look like? Virtual, virtual what, reality or something? Like, how would you output that? Yeah, you, you see, that's that's the that's the question, right? How would you output it? Because for for any normal scientific theory, we, we you may not know the answer, but you know what the answer would look like, right? It would be a set of numbers, or it would be a topolo- you know, some sort of weird topological form, or some, you know, we 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 kind of know what what theory is supposed to look like. What would it? What would a theory of consciousness ever output? What would, and so and so, I think you're right on the money by saying virtual reality because. Uh, I think the only way to actually do real experiments on consciousness is to be the system itself, to experience it first person. Now, how are you going to experience it first person? You know, for, for things that aren't too different, yes, I think virtual reality would would do. But but the other the other thing that you might do is look, let's 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 talk about a um, kind of a standard experiment. So so I'm you're a neuroscientist and you're looking at this. Uh, you know, whatever living thing it's going to be, you've got some electrodes or some, some optogenetics or something, you're, you're watching the brain. That's all of that stuff is getting processed via some sort of computer algorithm. It's coming out on a screen. And then you're watching that screen with your eyeballs and saying, ah, that's a conscious experience of, of, you know, of a fear of, or, or whatever it is, right? That's, that's what we're looking at. Now, what you're what you're seeing, of course, is some sort of third person description of what the neurons are doing. You actually have no idea what the actual experience is. You might be able to say something about behavior. You might be able to say, "Oh yeah, I predict this thing's gonna, you know, run away from whatever I, you know, whatever we just did." But let's but let's go further. Let's say, why do we have all this weird um, uh, technical interface between that creature and and my and 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 my you know and my brain? Let's get rid of all that. I'm gonna wire. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna take the output of my electrodes. I'm gonna wire them directly into my brain. I'm not going to go through a computer screen and a, and a, you know and my eyeballs and you know my retina and everything else. I'm just going to wire it into my brain. And so now now you're kind of you're on your way because now to some extent you're actually experiencing as if it were a sense, right? So instead of retinas, imagine if instead of retinas we now had an interface that read other people's brains. You're on your way a little bit, right? Because now you're directly experiencing some of what they're experiencing, not exactly, right? And then eventually you say Wait a minute! I don't. I don't want this. I don't want these electrodes at all. I'm just going to fuse my brain to their brain the way that your left and right hemispheres are fused together. Like you're going to do such a good job, and and this is all doable. Mm-hmm. You're going to do such a good job fusing that you want the direct experience. Now, the only the only thing to keep in mind is you are not going to be you are not going to become that creature and know what it's like to be that creature. Both you and that creature are going to know what it's like to now be a third creature that didn't exist before. That is a combination of the two of you, mm. right? This is and like so, Siamese twin studies or something. It, it, very close, actually. Very close. This is all extremely relevant. But but now, you know, the key thing is that we can do all this now, right? We can do all these all these kind of cut and paste experiments are totally doable. And uh, Are they limited but, by the similarity of the brains? Because I imagine that if you take something, you know, you talk about... Uh, like a flatworm, would you be able to fuse the brain of a flatworm with the brain of a of a human? Because it sure, seems sure. like the, people, the structures people, are like sufficiently parallel. Well, the structures, well, the structures are completely different, but that doesn't matter. But you see, so so you can never know what it's like to be a flatworm because you're not a flatworm. Only a flatworm will know what it's like to be a flatworm. But you can know what it's like to be a creature that's half you and half flatworm. <laughs> and so, right? And so, so people actually Where could I been, sign up? Is that a yeah, problem of motivations? Like we're not going to understand the motivations of the flatworm? Is is that it? Like we're always going to be seeing things through human motivational structures? I'm not even sure that it's necessarily human. I mean, we can get into that whole question of what exactly is a human because it's not very obvious at all. But but you know, so so there's been work for example, somebody put um Drosophila neurons into the brains of human patients. Like that's been done. And the Drosophila neurons do fine. They interface with the other neurons. There, you know, it was an epilepsy, it was a treatment for epilepsy that was done in Russia. And um you you know uh, yeah you you're 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 never going to turn yourself into a into a flatworm, but you can certainly modify your structure. I mean, at some point, with all the bioengineering that goes on, at some point you're going to say, you know, I would like a third hemisphere, and we know that can work because because in the blind your your other senses take over that new real estate right that's that's released if, when your eyes aren't working. So we know that your brain regions can take over new real estate. We already know that. So 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 at some point you might say. I, I want a third hemisphere because I want more, more real, you know, more processing power for some of the things my brain does. And don't make it out of human cells. I would really like it to be very regenerative. So how about some axolotl? And and you know, and there will be some, you know, the details of immune rejection, whatever. Those are just details. You know, the fundament, the fundamental, like the, you know, the 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 
fundamental aspects of it are, are totally solvable. So, so th then you can do experiments on consciousness. Then you can say, wow, now I see what it's like to be a creature that's got two human hemispheres and a third axolotl hemisphere, whatever I'm making that up, whatever you, whatever you're going to be. Um, then you can study consciousness, but, but as long as you are observing it from the outside, I don't think you're studying consciousness. I think you're studying correlates of consciousness or things that may or may not potentiate consciousness. So, so this is why you and can like, see what's why the, I, really the goal of a theory of consciousness anyways, is it to, are you going to try to explain the, like the emergence of this experience? Is that the goal? Um, that's a good, that's a really good question. Uh, I think that, I think that some people who work in this field to them, there's a much more basic question, which is the question of what is, what, what is it in the first place? Like what is a, what is a useful definition of consciousness? Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, but if what you're saying is correct, that the, these cognitive, uh, agentic processes go all the way down to the cellular level, then it's, it's almost like when I was reading some of your work, I got the impression that what you were saying, I'm probably totally wrong, correct me, is that consciousness or, or cognition, let's and an agency, these things aren't something that emerges at this like meta level, you know, at the wider organismal level, but that they're actually goal seeking behaviors all the way down. And so it almost sounds to me like you're saying that that theory of consciousness or metacognition or whatever you want to say isn't uh it, it's sort of an elusive quest because there's probably something going on at every level and it's not just this thing that snaps into place all of a sudden um yeah but well all of all of that is true so 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 i do think that uh there are uh, a, a cognitive experiences of all, all of your parts so your your tissues, your organs, your cells, uh, and and probably the molecular networks in your cells um, are goal seeking agents of a particular type, and they will have some kind of cognition. They will have some degree of intelligence, meaning problem solving in various weird spaces like like physiological spaces and transcriptional spaces, and so on. Uh, that doesn't mean that um, when you and I are talking now, there isn't a new emergent, very high level. Uh, additional agent that forms, right? Which which is great, and it's verbal, and we can have this conversation. But at the same time, there are lots of other agents on both sides of this connection that are not verbal that we are not talking to, and that we're only beginning to understand um, how to you know how to how to commu communicate with them. Um, when yeah, you, I mean, wait, you say you you say something interesting there about the sort of the problem solving ability on a cellular level. Where can you so? In the process of regenerating, let's say, a limb, is there really a problem to be solved or is there a program to be executed? Um, I don't think those are, uh, those are not mutually exclusive. I think executing programs is one way to solve problems. I think uh, whether or not it's actually, uh, uh, you know, whether or not the, the metaphor of a, pro of a program is actually useful to that scenario remains to be seen. But for sure, it, it's useful. Uh, for sure, the problem solving paradigm is, is absolutely useful. So um, w William James's definition of intelligence was the ability to get to the same goals by different means. The idea was that you're looking at an agential system when you can figure out what it wants and it has the ability to some degree of competency, right? From, from very primitive kind of intelligences to very advanced intelligences, some, some capability of getting to its goal, even though things are changing perturbations, the, the environment changes, you've moved the thing, you know, you've moved stuff around and it still can do that. That is seen all the way from, from bacteria on up in various spaces. You just have to be Clever. The, the thing about the thing about recognizing agency and intelligence is that it's a two-way operation. When 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 we try to estimate how much intelligence something has or how much agency it has, we are ourselves taking an IQ test. Because if we're not clever enough to recognize what the system is doing, we're going to say, "Oh man, that's a paperweight. That's not really doing anything." And really, it might be doing all kinds of interesting things. Right? And this is probably why people think bacteria are very simple little organisms, and humans are super complex because they're not capable of recognizing. You know, yeah, just how complicated and difficult it is being a bacteria. My favorite. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, and the reason you know the reason is is because our all of our senses are pointing outwards. So our training set of what you know, he, all animals and in particular, you know, humans and and others, you know, primates and social animals are very good at recognizing agency around them. It's extremely important when you look around to say, 
is that a rock? And therefore, I know it's only going to do certain things based on its environment. Or is that, a, you know, a sleeping tiger? And it's going to do all kinds of things that have nothing to do with which way the hill is pointing down or not. You know, it's very important for us to, uh, to catch agency in the, in the environment. But all of our senses are pointing outward. So we are very good at seeing intelligence that operates at medium size scales, roughly things about our size, medium time scales, not evolutionary time frames, nor mic, you know, micro, you know, micro millisecond time. So, and everything that to us, all the all the intelligence that we know how to recognize takes place in three-dimensional space. So we know we can see you know, uh, um, certain kinds of activities, moving things from here to there, opening locks and bringing this to the over there. And those kinds of things are, we, we're, we're primed to recognize intelligence in three-dimensional space. That's because all of our senses are pointing outwards. If we had, imagine if, imagine if we had built-in um, biofeedback so that uh, you had an immediate sense of everything your, your uh, pancreas was doing at any given moment, right? Now we, now we don't, but imagine if you did. If if we had an experience all the way from from our you know from our early or early um, uh, time we we were in uh, an embryo, we had the experience of knowing what was going on and what did our pancreas do in response. We would have no trouble recognizing the pancreas as a kind of really intelligent uh, uh, creature that navigates this amazingly complicated physiological space. Right, because you know the glucose is going up and down, all these hormones and, and all this stuff is going on in the environment, things you eat. And all the time, what's the what? What are your organs doing? They're trying to keep you in optimal health, despite all this craziness that, that you subject them to, um, with with rhythms and diet and everything else. And we would, if we had access to that data set, we would recognize these things as. And nowadays, when we think of robotics, when I say robot, you think it's this thing that moves around and it you know moves around in three D space. Things like um, an automated insulin pump that you might have in your body, right? If you if you needed one, that's a robot. That's a robot that works in physiological space. It moves around in this physiological space. It might measure all sorts of different um, uh, chemicals in your bloodstream that are all these orthogonal dimensions of the space. And it is navigating that space just like any robot would navigate three-dimensional space. And it's just on us to, to um, be, be, be more open-minded than our, than our typical uh, senses have led us to be. The corollary of that is that you could easily <clears throat> learn to look inward the same way that you have to learn to be able to identify intelligence that's non-standard. Because I've known diabetics that after years of carrying an insulin pump, they're able to tell you what's happening to their insulin without the pump. And so what happens is that you have this feedback of what's actually happening. You have something, like you were saying earlier about the ability, if you measure something and you can tie it to something else, then you begin to have kind of a functional system which allows you to see something that wasn't visible before and i wonder if it's not the same for other bodily systems and yeah. our inability to see it is due to sort to to a lack of data yeah yeah i think that's i think that's spot on i think that's exactly right and and let's be clear there are lots of pre-scientific traditions people people have spent before modern science people have spent a lot of time figuring this out so there are a whole you know if you want to think about um, yoga and these and things like this there are a lot of people who do all kinds of uh, exercises to a uh, gain control over various body functions that you normally don't have any access to and um, uh, these kinds of uh, these kinds of ideas that uh, that talk about, uh, you know, the various kinds of intelligence of, of the things, that, you know, the different subsystems of your body. I mean, this has, this has existed for, for a really long time. I think, you know, we're not, uh, you know, we're discovering it now in a rigorous sort of mathematical way and so on. But these ideas have been around forever. And, uh, and, and the idea that, I mean, I mean, Pavlov in the, I mean, you know, of course, even older than that, but Pavlov in the twenties was, was, um, trying to train organs. You know, he didn't just train dogs. He actually trained the organs of the dogs, right? Mm -hmm. He was doing all kinds of interesting experiments with memory of, of bodily organs. This was, yeah, we, you know, this is not just something that's coming up now. And by the way, to, to put this back to the discussion about consciousness, that's probably even older than this of people saying that the only way to understand your consciousness is to work on your consciousness and to experience it, whether or not it's going to be through um, uh, thought modification practices, which might be meditation, or they might be, you know, there's a whole bunch of techniques, or whether it's it's psychedelic drugs, whether it's uh, different ways to change, you know, how, how, you, <clears throat> how you, you go through life, whatever. But this idea that, that you have to be a participant in the study of consciousness, you can't be an external observer, is, is ancient, super ancient. It's funny that you say that because I've always 
sort of looked at the world now and I've thought that we are entering into an era where the ability to understand and communicate will be the most important ability because we have developed all of these technological tools up until this point. And it seems sort of to be a little bit dramatic about it that the final frontier is the ability to communicate. And in order to be able to communicate to to cause the sorts of changes that you want in the world without having to micromanage them. And I imagine that being on or, with, an, or within your own body too. Within like I was thinking about th these 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 uh what do you call them robot organs uh don't they need to be able to integrate into that sense of self as well like they need to communicate in such a way that they understand that this is their self now is i mean what yeah yeah i mean it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, uh question uh we, we like to we like to draw boundaries around the organism so that you say okay you know here's a human and right at the at the sort of at the edge of their skin is where the body stops but if you think about the internal organs what's their external environment as far as your kidney is concerned the 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 cells sitting next to it that's its external environment right so so yes it's part of a greater it's part of a greater organism as as we are parts of an even greater system but but at every point there are smaller selves within within these larger selves, and they have an external environment, which from the perspective of the higher level system, you look down and you say, no, no, you're still all part of me. You're still part of the same thing. But and and that's and that's great for you, but 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 for them for them, uh, they are dealing with an external environment. Whatever comes through the bloodstream, they don't have immediate control over that. That's their extra, they can take actions and maybe, you know, in the next 20 minutes, things will get better, or maybe they won't. But but these are things that are happening to them from the outside as far as they're concerned. But you also run in this problem then with like externalities, right? Where you're if they don't treat their external environment as something that's theirs, then Perhaps you you could build up damage. You, you get aging. You? Yeah, you get problems, <laughs> right? Uh, to the extent Which, that we understand how aging even occurs in cancer and things like corrosive yeah, disorders. Yeah, yeah damage. Sure, oh. sure, sure, sure. And and we have we have we have some some work on this and specifically in cancer, where what you can do is you can you can specifically disconnect cells from their neighbors electrically, and as soon as you do that, the 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 as as I've called it this 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 cognitive light cone the boundary of the goals that these that these systems can um can take care of are is shrinks from 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 the large goal of hey I'm maintaining a nice organ to a tiny goal of oh, I'm I'm a single cell mm. the rest of this body is just external environment as far as I'm concerned I'm an amoeba again mm. and what are my goals my goals are to become two amoebas and uh and to go where life is good so that's metastasis. And mm. so, and, and, and maybe at some point I'll try to regain some sort of the half-assed multicellularity and I'll try to make a tumor, but mm. you know, not really, not really useful as far as the larger system is concerned. Um, but, and, and you can go in the opposite direction. You can take a, a cell expressing a really nasty, um, oncogene, which is uh, trying to depolarize and, and, and disconnect, and you can artificially force it to remain connected. And then guess what? Even though the, the genetic damage is there, it will be part of a normal tissue. Mm. Right. And mm. so, and so this idea of, of, the, the the boundary between self and world um, shrinking and growing happens all the time in our bodies. It, it grows during embryonic development and shrinks during cancer. It, it, and outside it, of our bodies too. I mean, this is just, I, I can't like help but see the social implications of this as well, where like, especially in our country right now, you have this like stark division between the ideas of individualism, stark individualism, you know, especially where we live, like in the state of Jefferson out here, you know, it's like, there's this, there's this real like, tension between the idea of how much is does me matter versus my community versus my country and so on and so forth yeah. and it seems like a huge part of bioengineering in the future and social engineering the right word um a you terrifying know, version <laughs> of the right word uh, governing governing a society is going to come down to uh patterning the development of that balance yeah, like how much does yeah. this translate from the organismal level to the social level? Is that something that's beyond the the scope here? I mean, I, I don't think it's beyond the scope. I want to be careful and uh, be clear that uh, I don't have any particular expertise uh, in in talking about of these course. social things. This is the Ex speculation. Hour, you are a human, sorry. though, so you're entitled to a human yeah. perspective. So. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. And and I actually, um, you know, and and I've actually lived, uh, you know, the first part of my life, my my childhood in a in a society that was so. So I was born in Russia, and and you know, during the height of uh, you know the USSR and, mm. and so on. So it was so, Anastasia, so I, actually. Well, not during the height. I I was born uh, uh, in the collapse. Sorry. I invented the collapse. Yes. <laughs> 
I see. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I was there. I was there long before that, and so and so we can we can talk about that a little bit. I think I, th- I think what's really important to keep in mind is that it's no. I mean, the, the the cancer example is a little misleading because there, what you take away from that is, oh man, uh, everything should just be connected and and following these large scale goals, and then light, and then we're good, right? We don't have cancer. We have a nice organism. So, so that te- that try that so, sort of suggests that you should just you know connect everything up and and follow these higher goals and so on. You got to be careful with that because because. When was the last time you lost any sleep over how many cells you shed every day, right? Never. And so the nice, the, the important thing about these large systems is that they develop new goals that often don't really overlap at much at all with the goals of the subsystems. Mm. So when you, when you connect all of these things into this larger glorious whole, you got to remember to, to, to ask yourself, well, well, what happened to the, to the individuals and uh, are they better off or worse off? And then, you know, again, people uh, think about evolution and so on. They say, oh, of course, you're better off. I mean, look at, you know, look at the 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 the, the large animal is able to, you know, pr- have be very successful as opposed to individual bacteria. Sure, the large animal is, but how about the individual cells of that large animal? Are they any better off than they would have been if they were bacteria? I, I'm not sure, right? It's not obvious at all. And so, so these higher levels show up and then they have goals and then they have bigger goals that are, that say you know I'm I'm gonna go um, I'm gonna go uh, I'm, I'm gonna take up boxing okay and and I'm gonna meet all of my personal goals of you know whatever and yeah you know I'm gonna lose some cells I'll lose some brain cells and I'll lose some knuckle skin and I'll lose some some other stuff no problem well that's great for you mm. um, but right so but but you see you see where I'm going with this so I think I think we have to be very careful with interpreting the cancer example as suggesting that we should just max max out the the larger the goal the better i don't think that's that necessarily true at all well no i, I was seeing it more like as a balancing act actually yeah. right yeah. and yeah. i wonder what it's like integrating you know back to the robotic organs or back to tissue regeneration or cancer <clears throat> uh, uh remediation it seems like you're always going to be seeking this really delicate equilibrium and trying to typify the pattern of that equilibrium so that you can instruct the tissue to wander in that direction. And it seems to me like, I I could be totally wrong, but from your work, I'm getting the impression that it's about finding out what the goals of those cells on those different scales are so that the goals can be over, can be sort of, uh, yeah, complementary to the the maximal extent. So you have this balance between all of their different goals. And then you would have maybe perfect health or something, or you could... Uh, but how- I, I, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think the key is there's going to be some sort of positive. Uh, there's some sort of uh, balance that that will be optimal. Uh, there, I think we're we're very uh, rapidly leaving the domain of science and entering. I'm not sure what because because I, I don't think there's any scientific uh, method that's going to tell you what the right balance is. Mm. There's going to be science that tells you what balances are achievable, what balances are stable, what balances are um, you know, possible with certain methods, whatever. But, but all of them are going to be trade-offs in the sense that somebody's goals are going to be met and somebody else's goals are not going mm. to be met. Mm-hmm. And the systems making those decisions are biased. You know, When a bunch of people sit around and decide what to do, uh, they're awfully biased to the human scale side of things. Uh, uh, you know, um, and so the, if finding this, finding a proper balance and deciding what a good balance is, is, is distinctly non-trivial. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a simple uh, kind, of, kind of example, but I think this is the kind of thing that, that keeps me up at night sometimes. Mm. There, was this, there was this story of, of, of a, um, a, a psychotherapist who was, he was treating somebody with uh, what, what, what used to be called multiple personality disorder. I guess now it's a like dissociative identity disorder. And so the deal is that uh, the patient comes in and he says, uh, this is driving me crazy. I can't, I can't keep a job because these other personalities are coming up and some of them are pretty rowdy and, you know, and I'm getting fired and like, I can't have this. We got to fix this. And, uh, and the, the therapist is, yep, we got this thing called integration therapy and we're going to work together and we're going to, you know, we're going to integrate you and you'll be back, you know, you'll be back, back to normal. So they're working on this. And, <clears throat> and so one day patient comes in and it's the other, and it's the other personality. And he says, Hey doc, what's this I hear about integration? And he says, well, we're going to, he said, well, well, let's, let's just break that down for me. When, when, when you integrate, where am I going to be? And he's like, well, you're kind of going to be gone. And <laughs> really. And so well, that's, I, I don't like the sound of that. What happened to the Hippocratic oath? You, 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 you and this other guy are working on making me disappear. What's up with that? 
And, and, uh, you know, and, and so that really, to me, that really gets to the bottom of this whole issue, right? Because there are certain selves and, and agents that are very, that are verbal and very good at advocating for themselves, like your left hemisphere for most of us. You are home to another agent, which is normally not heard from until somebody cuts the, you know, the, the corpus callosum and then, and then you can find out what your right hemisphere thinks. And there's all kinds of other subunits inside of us that, that we normally, you know, you normally are going to take the side of the larger system, not necessarily the side of the cell. So, so all of this, I think, is really tricky as far as who's deciding what on whose behalf and who's forcing what other system into a different uh, fate than they otherwise would have had. It's, it's, it's very non-obvious. And so in a worm where you are, you know, leading it to generate two heads or you take uh, a salamander and you regrow its limbs, even so going from the sort of the, the non, I don't want to say non-natural, but the sort of the, the bodily organization that's not found in nature to the regular aspect of regrowth. Is there a difference in the sort of the communication that's happening there, or is the only difference that it's coming from the outside versus internal? I think that uh, one one way to think about this is um, uh, you, you can so 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 the biological example. Well, I'll just tell you what the biological example is, and then we'll we'll sort of um, we'll we'll dissect a little bit. What you can do, what, what, what you can have is uh, you, can, you can notice that the pieces of a, of a flower have an electrical circuit. Every cell has a particular set of ion channels and the whole thing forms this giant electrical circuit that has a number of stable states and it has a number of different conditions that it could land in. And those electrical states turn on and off various genes downstream that cause heads or tails to be built in various configurations. What the genome does really well is make sure that uh, by default, with, with, uh, with nothing else happening, that electrical circuit will always land in the correct state, one head of the right size and shape for that species, boom, nice and stable. What we figured out how to do is to go in and push the cells towards one of these other stable states. When you do that, you basically push it towards a different memory. I mean, literally a different memory of what a correct planarian should look like. So we can, so so then the pieces will make multiple heads. They will make heads belonging to other species. So this is, you know, you said well, you you just use use the word natural a moment ago. It's natural in the sense that there really are other species of planaria crawling around with those kinds of heads, mm. just not correct for this species. It go back to this idea of hardware software. The hardware hasn't been changed. And you the can DNA, you do this just by manipulating the ion channels. That's correct. That's correct. And this is, yeah. I think, what I meant at the beginning when I said this isn't like your typical biochemical situation. Because when I took developmental biology in college, I mean, granted, this is like fifteen years ago, it was like, oh well, this chemical is being emitted over here. This you know embryo portion of the embryo is going to start you know moving over this way, and there's these chemical gradients, and that's pretty much controlling everything. And you're like. No, you can just grow ahead wherever you want as long as it gets the right, you know, patterning somehow. I mean, th those things are not incompatible. So, so all the things that you just said are still happening. Right. So, so there are still gradients. There are still chemicals. There are still genes being turned on and off. All that is still happening. Uh, the the trick is to ask yourself. Well, here here's a simple question that hardly anybody works on. We still don't know how does it know when to stop. So, mm -hmm. so here, so you got a planaria and you cut you cut its head off. And then the cells will start to grow like crazy, faster than any tumor. They start to grow, but then it stops. Why does it stop? It stops because the correct planarian head has been finished. Mm -hmm. Well, how in, how does it know what a correct planarian head is supposed to look like? And is right? this what you mean well, by memory? Because I, I I guess when you when you speak of memory, I think of something that has been sort of held over from the past. But this seems like something that is discovered in the future. Do you know what I mean by that? There, the, yeah. Um, so, so, so I, I use a very generic definition of memory. So, so memory is a, a, some sort of physical data structure that guides your future behavior based on things that have happened in the past. So that could be, that, that could be computer memory. That could be um, behavioral memory. That could be pattern memory. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a memory because what we can do is we can take a planarian, change the electrical pattern, and it'll just sit there when nothing is happening until you cut the head off. It's a latent memory. It's not active. When you cut the head, so it's a memory of 
what you're going to do in the future if you get injured. It's a counterfactual memory, right? And in fact, it's a false memory because we've because instead of a nice uh, picture of a one-headed worm, you're now carrying this this weird idea of what a worm is supposed to look like. It's actually a two-headed <laughs> two-headed shape. So it's kind of a false memory, but whatever, it's your memory. And so now. Uh, when you do get injured, the the cells will build to that. They will use that memory as the as their set point of what a correct planarian should look like. And when can we stop? Can we stop when we've made one head? No, because the memory of a, what a correct planarian is is two heads. And and think about think about the the simplest way to think about this. Think about your thermostat in your house. Right, the thermostat is a very simple example of of like the basement of agential systems. It has a simple memory. What does it remember? It only remembers one thing. What is the correct temperature? And it needs to know that, and it's encoded, and uh, it will keep working as hard as it can to make sure that the that that's the actual that the, the delta, the error between the the measured temperature and this memory is as low as possible. That's what all these regenerative systems do. They measure the error, which when you get injured, the error goes sky high. Stress goes up. You're stressed. The stress is I gotta I gotta reduce this. I gotta reduce this stress. I gotta reduce that error. And I'm going to do whatever I can to get back to the set point. In the meantime, some scientists like us came along and changed the set point. So hold on, I have a question about this. And this might be a stupid question. So when you cut the head off of a worm, I imagine that there's two ways in which it can regrow. One is just this sort of almost 3D printed version where the front, each each layer of cells that is deposited has the structures within it, and they basically build until the structure is in three-dimensional space appropriate, and then they stop, versus a sort of more root-based way of things growing where you have, let's say, you develop the circular the circulatory system and then cells grow out from that like leaves on a tree. Which way does a planarian regrow its head? Uh, n- neither. A planarian okay. does something entirely different. So so what a planarian does is, 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 is kind of amazing. Uh, and what they do is... You see, all the planarian cells, and this we have no idea how this works, but all the planarian cells uh, together, the collective, not individual cells, but the collective, has a really good idea of what the size and scale of a proper planarian is. So what happens is when you chop off the head, the remaining cells at the, at the wound become uh, head become no- nose. I mean, there's no nose, but you know, the tip of the, they, they basically decide that they are now the tip of the, the front, the most anterior tip of the planarian, the cells behind them will say, well, then I must be brain. And so they will remodel themselves to be a brain. The cells behind them say, well, I got to be, you know, something else. And the whole thing as it's regenerating, the whole thing is shrinking. Why is it shrinking? Because when the new tiny little head forms, you don't want to be a big planarian with a tiny head. That doesn't work. <laughs> you want to be per- you want to be perfectly proportioned. So it's it's absolutely amazing. They keep their proportion. The rest of the animal shrinks to be co- a correctly sized and shaped much smaller worm, right? So so that's what happens. Well, and what why why can't humans do this? Uh, humans can do this uh, when they are very very young. So human embryos. You know what happens when you cut a human embryo in half, right? You get twins. You get you get monozygotic twins. Yeah. So so I you know w- w- I, I I remind my students when they say, oh man, you know, is planaria are amazing. They can they can regenerate from even a small fraction of of their body. So well, half of you can regenerate a whole human from one cell, right? So so we can we can do that. We all start life as a fertilized egg, and we regenerate. I mean, development. I think, and this is also controversial, but I think I think that development is just a um, a special case of regeneration. Uh, it's, it's so. Can you get two? Can you cut the planarians in such a way and have them re- that they regenerate into two worms? Because that seems like to. I mean, and uh, well, they do. I mean, you okay. can cut it. You can. The, the record is like two hundred and seventy six pieces, and every piece gives rise to a worm, to a full on worm. Mm-hmm. But every, there's, yeah, every, there's clearly record. something else going on here, right? Records. Like they're they're definitely multicellular organisms that are able to regenerate whole organ systems. Right. I mean, a head, let's say. Do they say. sexually reproduce? Uh, they can. Some planarian species can, yeah. Uh, they they often don't bother. I mean, which which is a, which is a whole other interesting... Hmm. Uh, that, that's a whole other interesting thing. Imagine <laughs> when when we... When, when creatures reproduce through sperm and egg, right? There's, there's this thing we have, which is called Weissman's barrier, which is the idea that if you get some crazy mutation in your body during your lifespan... That doesn't transfer to your children because your children all come from one cell, right? The rest of your body is disposable. 
in and and that and that's uh, in in planaria that's not true because the way they generally reproduce not all species but the way some species reproduce is they tear themselves in half they literally tear themselves in half the front half makes a new tail the back end makes a new head now you got two worms great right now you've reproduced so if you do that think about what that means that means that every mutation that doesn't kill the the stem cell that it hits is amplified into the new into the offspring and so and so this is why the the genomes of the planarians are an incredible mess they're mixoploid mm. they have different numbers of chromosomes for god's sake oh, wow. and right and you don't even know you know we, we, the, the genetics are a mess we don't have a proper assembly for some of these species because we don't you don't know what you're sequencing every cell has a different number of chromosomes now now think about what that but think about what that means right um for 400 million years you've been accumulating mutations you every cell has a different number of chromosomes you're a complete mess at the genetic level and you are the world champion regenerator. Mm-hmm. Your anatomy is rock solid. Every time you get cut, 100% of the time, you make the correct thing. Yeah, who would have 100% of the time? Like you never <laughs> see like a misshaped worm come out of a cut? It's, ex- it's, it's extremely rare. Okay. If, you, if, you cut, if you cut very thin, tiny pieces, they get confused sometimes. You can do that. But regular, but, but just, you know, normal cuts into, into large chunks, they, they never screw up. They, they always do it right. And so... How is that oh, possible? Yeah. It is yeah, like this lead yeah. to a lot of problems. Do you get a lot of really deranged planarium? It's like whole species <laughs> of monsters or no, no, no absolutely okay. no, absolutely not. And That's so so this is so so I want to say two things about that that are interesting. One one is that think about think about how little we must know about the relationship between the genome and the anatomy when you can basically trash the genome for hundreds of millions of years. And still have rock solid anatomy. If you mm-hmm. if you didn't know about planaria, you went through a developmental biology or a genetics class, and somebody said to you at the end, "I want you to make a prediction. I'm gonna I'm gonna screw up the genome so bad your cells are gonna be mixoploid, like a tumor that has different. You know, we we know that in tumors there's genetic you know damage and whatever the different numbers of chromosomes. I'm gonna do that. What, what do you think your anatomy is gonna be like? What would you have said? Right? Any normal person going through a genetics or a developmental biology class was, oh man, you're going to be a mess. You're going to be a tumor at best, right? Yeah. So, so, so our standards... And that does happen to- though, right? Like we do have, there are definitely... Teratomas? Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's developmental disorders that, you know, babies are born with multiple chromosomes and it makes makes problems, right? So, that, so, so both, some, sometimes, sometimes, but, but we're not very, but, but you see, we're not very regenerative is the problem. Right, right. And, so, and what is and that so, hinge? What is the... I, no, 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 nobody has any idea. <laughs> I mean, my, 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 point, my point is not that I have an answer to yeah, any of yeah. this. My, po- my point is that I think it's very critical to keep an eye on your, your um, knowledge gaps. Because because people go through a whole education in genetics and developmental biology, and they never hear of this stuff. Right. right? right. And they, and w- when you read a developmental biology or a genetic textbook, you get the feeling that yeah, this is cool. We got this under control. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we know a bunch of stuff. And 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 I'm saying no, no. There are fundamental gaps in our knowledge that we don't even we we, we have no idea what what what's going on here because nobody would have predicted that that this that this that this thing would be true. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing, uh, so so that's you know so so that's uh, that, that that's kind of um, an important thing about 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 planaria is that there's uh, about any of this is that there's this distinction between what the hardware is going to do and what the um, you know, the, uh, the specification of the hardware you get out of the genome and then the amazing ability of the software to do all kinds of interesting things. And we can get into all the plasticity and the, you know, including the Xenobots that you mentioned and all, all the other, um, types of amazing problem solving that we see. It's just, there are huge things we don't understand. When, when we talked to you on the phone earlier, uh, before the show, you mentioned that, uh, so the Xenobots stuff got a lot of coverage in the news. Um, was you, you seem to express that you felt like some aspects of that had been handled poorly? Do, do you do you recall mentioning this, or, or you felt like there you felt like some of the key points were were sort of glossed over? Well, this is true. I, I don't you know uh, I, I don't know what handled poorly. I, I certainly think that a lot of people have not yet understood what I think to be the main uh, the main importance of this, and other people focused on aspects of this that uh, I think they got, you know, they, they, they got the story wrong. Um, and then there have been some just completely crazy uh, news stories that just totally screwed up the facts, uh, you know, in a, in a very wild way. So uh, sounds about right. Uh, what, uh, yeah, yeah. what do you think are, are the salient features that, that maybe got missed or, or could have been centered better? Well, there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, let, let's start off with, um, with what I think, what I think is, is, is important and, and significant here. 
there are three ways in which this whole technology is, uh, and, and just to just to remind in case anybody doesn't know what this is, this is the observation that when you, and then this is, this is joint work that um, is done in collaboration with uh, Joshua Bongard's lab at the University of Vermont. And this is Sam Kriegman, uh, who's the computer scientist, and Doug Blackiston, who's the, in my group, who's the biologist. Um, this is a joint project. And uh, it's, it's, it's the observation that when you take skin cells from a frog embryo, and you liberate them from the instructions that normally say, you're going to have a very boring life. You're going to sit there quietly as a two-dimensional layer on the outside of um, uh, on the outside of the embryo, and you're going to keep out the pathogens. That's what you're going to do. And so, so when you liberate cells from that condition, you, you, you take these skin cells, you put them in a, in, a, in a different environment, and you basically say, well, now you don't have those instructive cues. You can reimagine your multicellularity. What are you going to be? right? What are you going to do? And, and they could have done all kinds of things. They could have crawled off. They could have made a monolayer like a cell culture. They could have died. They could have done all sorts of things. Instead, what they do is they come together in about 48 hours, they come together and they form this new creature that we, we call a xenobot for Xenopus lavis is the name of the frog. And it's a biobot. And it, and it makes this little proto-organism that does all kinds of amazing things. It, it swims around on its own. It has all kinds of behaviors. It has group behaviors. It has individual behaviors. It can regenerate if you damage it. It, um, it, it, and it, is, it does all these interesting things. So what, one of the most amazing things that it does is that because it can't reproduce the normal way, because it does, doesn't have the normal frog reproductive organs, it, it figured out a completely new way to replicate itself. So what it can do is if you give it a bunch of loose cells, it basically does a version of what, no, what, what von Neumann was, was uh, toying with this idea of a replicator that goes around and collects parts and then builds a copy of itself. Mm -hmm. They basically run around and they, and they herd like, like uh, sheepdogs, they herd a bunch of loose cells into little piles and sculpt them into other xenobots. And then guess what they do? They will run around and do the same thing. And there's, you know, three or four generations down. So, and, and there's no genetic, there's no genomic editing anywhere here. If you sequence these things, all you're going to ever see is Xenopus lavis and you have no idea. You would have zero. This is, this wow. is going back to that, that idea of how much do we really know about the genome and the anatomy? If you can have something that acts and looks in a completely different way and has the same wild type anatomy, with the same wild type genome. Right? And do you think that this is possible with cells from, or from other organisms or is there something special about... There's, there's nothing froggy about this. I, 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 can't, I can't go into details now because I, I don't talk about unpublished work but, you sure. know, in these contexts, but the, the, I can just tell you this has nothing to do with frogs. It's, it, it's, it's a much more, no, nor embryos, it's a much more general phenomenon. So you think that you could make something like this from human cells? Yeah, we, we will see. Stay tuned. Oh, we will, we will whoa. Okay. Need some permission All for right. that, probably. But, uh, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll see. Yeah, I but, wanna, uh, put that on your calendars. So, so let's. So so let me let me let me just uh, let me just uh, finish finish that 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 sure. point. So so this is this is what they're doing with their standard genomes, right? And what what I think is what I think is is really significant here is that for every other creature on Earth. If you ask the question, why does it look the way it looks? Why does it have the behavior it has? Why is it this color? Why does it have this many eyes? The answer is always the same because for millions of years, the ancestors were selected for this and that. That doesn't exist here. These things never existed before. All of these cells were selected to be a nice, quiet uh, uh, skin, skin layer, right? Instead, on their own, they, they have a much more exciting life. They're autonomous. They run around. They do all kinds of stuff. So the question of where do these things come from? Where does its body plan come from, right? If you ask, where does a frog body plan come from? Well, people will say, well, selection, you know, millions of years of selection for being a nice frog. Well, where does Xenobot body, bodies come from? There's never been selection. It's an artificial Xenobot. selection, is it, is it not? I mean, if you're scraping off this skin cell versus that. Or but something. we're not selecting them. But I mean, but, but we're not selecting them. I mean, we do not know anything that it takes to build a robot that does this kind of stuff, right? The answer to how does it know to, you know, to, to, to do all these things is not because Mike and Josh made them do it. I mean, there, there's a component of the project where we use machine learning to kind of nudge them towards specific outcomes, right? And that's, and that's very important to learn to do this. Um, is use that AI by like to, tuning the soup or something? Or? Uh, not yet, although that's where it's going. Up until now, we've just been sculpting. The, the AI says, you know, if you just cut away of you know, some cells from here to there, mm. they'll, they'll move better or they'll do certain things. Um, so, so, so look, there's, there's, there's three really important things about, about all this. One, one is that it's, uh, at some point we'll have useful synthetic living machines. So the, you know, they'll be scraping the, the plaque off your artery walls or, or chasing down tumor cells in your gut or something, you know, there's all kinds of useful applications. Uh, the second thing is that 
they're teaching us about how to how do collectives of cells make decisions about what to be. That that's the answer to regenerative medicine. The, the, the whole field of regenerative medicine is is basically stuck because we don't know the answer to that question. How do collections of cells make decisions about what they're going to do? The g- genome is not the answer. Stem cell biology is not the answer. Uh, it, it, we, we do not understand how collectives of cells make decisions, large-scale decisions. This is a sandbox model, a, a platform. It's a, you know, it's a very simple system. It's one, you know, one type of uh, tissue, just, just skin. Um, okay, so, so, so ultimately what this is for, way beyond useful, you know, useful machines, is we are going to try to understand how do you how do cells get their goals collect collectives of cells get their goals where did the goal of being a xenobot come from because it showed up in 48 hours did not require millions of years of evolution so the question is where did that goal come from and more importantly how do we respecify it so if we if i said you know um that's great and all but i don't want a round xenobot i want a long flat one and and i wanted to do this and that like what 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 are the signals that i need to give you because once we crack that that's the key to proper regenerative medicine where we can make new organs, we can fix birth defects, we can reprogram tumors. So all Is of that because you'd, you'd understand the goals of the organ cells and you could kind of give them what they want and they'll just execute their you, you, it, it'll, it, it'll be a combination of giving them what they want, meaning, meaning uh, incentivizing them with rewards and punishments and a combination of respecifying the goal states. Just like in the planaria, if your goal state for whatever reason is screwed up and you think you're going to be a tumor, I got a better goal state for you here. here here's a new pattern memory that you're going to follow. And, and I'm going to incentivize that with a little bit of, you know, whatever re- reward or, or punishment or whatever, whatever you're going to do. And then, and then the bigger picture, and this sort of takes us back to this conversation about like society and then everything that we were talking about. The bigger picture, I, I, I see this as, a, uh, as an existential as, as mitigation of, of existential risk for humanity. I mean, look at this. We are surrounded by systems, large scale systems like Internet of Things, uh, com- you know, computer networks, uh, swarm robotics, social structures, um, financial structures. We have, have only the barest beginnings of a science of knowing what do these collectives want as goals. We have absolutely no idea. In some right? way, we've and turned you- ourselves into cells that are part of a larger organ. That's correct. And the cells have no clue what the organism is going to want to do. What are the, what are the goals of the larger scale system? In fact, if you think of, uh, th- think of shrinking yourself down to the level of a single cell inside of an early embryo, and you're looking around and you're seeing all this stuff that's happening and all the noise and chaos and cells are dying off and moving from it, falling off and all this stuff. Would you ever in a million years know that this is going to make a 100% reliable fish or frog or human? You would never know that. If you didn't already know about embryonic development and the fact that it was reliable, you would never know that that's what was going to happen. And, and that, so, mm-hmm. no, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Well, j- just to finish up. So, so, so we, are, we are surrounding ourselves with complex systems that are going to have goals. Those goals are going to be different from ours. The, they're going to be as inscrutable to us as the goals of the organism are to the cells. You know, when you think about your your goals in the morning or your life plan for the next uh, you know three years, uh, the, the the cells in your body and the organs and the tissues don't even have the the the, the beginnings of a cognitive system to appreciate what what's going to what's going to go on here. Right? We're surrounding ourselves with with this, and we do not have a good science of anticipating and managing collective goals. So so my point is, if we can learn from some frog skin. Which, by the way, frogs are shedding into rivers all the time. So you know, uh, people get all, all crazy about this. But that, I mean, that's another thing. People say, "Oh my God, you know these these xenobots. This is frog skin, for, for God's sake." Do you you understand that we've had uh, our, we've had synthetic bacteria, viruses, both natural and synthetic. We've had germ warfare. We've had genetically modified um, uh, you know organisms being released. Like compared to all of that, this should be so far down on your list of things to worry about. It's ridiculous. It's, it's just completely ridiculous. The news cycle is hungry. So. Well, I, the, the news cycle is hungry. And I, di- I did have this weird feeling when they were starting to release genetically modified mosquitoes where I was like, why is no one freaking out about this? It was very sort of just matter of some fact. Some people, I mean, some people did freak out about it. Uh, People, I personally I was that, freaking out about it because I'm like, we hmm. have crossed the Rubicon at this point. Like this yep. is, this is. A, a huge decision to make to drive a specific parasite or disease carrying mosquito to extinction. I'm like, I don't know that we've, we've given enough. Yeah. No I mean, we've kind there. of, 
No, you're right. But I mean, we've kind of done that before. I mean, we've driven, we, we've, we've more or less driven polio to extinction, right? We've, uh, with, with native, native wheat and, and all the, like, like the old uh, school crops that are almost That's gone true. now. The right? oceans. Like we, yeah, yeah. We, we, we've been doing that for a while. And I think That's that. Um, People uh, are just so all- tired of it that they're like, eh, what's another one? Uh, n- n- I don't think so because because when they hear about the Xenobots, they suddenly are full of energy again, <laughs> and they friend and people freak out. I just I, I think we ought to uh, be really realistic about um, apportioning our limited our finite uh, energy for concern, right? Apportioning it proportionally to what's an actual problem, and I think we have plenty of problems to worry about. This is an extremely <laughs> safe system in which to understand a really critical thing, which is where complex systems get their goals. Like that's crucial. Do you, oh, I was going to say, do you, do you think that you could go out into the environment and find self-made xenobots? Like you say that frog skin is getting shed into the environment. Um, I'm sure that there's lots of other skin cells from lots of other animals. Our own skin cells get washed down the drain, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting point. Um, I read just yesterday, I read a paper about um, uh, cancer and clams. And the amazing thing about clam cancer is that the individual clam uh, tumor cells get released into the waterway and they find their way to other clams and they get in there and they infect them. Whoa. So they're sort of a, they can live on their own. And, and I, I have, I, I don't know if you, you, you got to see that um, life, death and self paper, but, but I talk about that exactly that you could imagine an organism it wouldn't be a you know wouldn't be a, a a mammal because it doesn't have it wouldn't work in dry land but in the water you could imagine an organism that when the organism dies there's still a bunch of living cells in there right there's lots of you know when a fish or a frog dies for whatever reason there's plenty of living cells in there they could in theory that could be a life um a, a, a kind of a kind of a life history where the cells go off they go off on their own and they either become amoebas and live as amoebas or they come back and they become some kind of a xenobot looking thing, you know, and then, you know, maybe they develop another developmental sequence. Like all of that are perfectly viable life strategies that you might find maybe on earth, maybe somewhere else. Um, yeah, I don't see why not. This what? really puts into perspective the funeral rites of various cultures. The fact that we're like, so like, you know what, we got to make sure that that body cannot do anything <laughs> after <Burn> death. It. <laughs> it's still yeah. very much alive. Why do you call them bots instead of straight up organisms like you one of Xenocute. one of the really cool papers you sent us i'll try to put all these in the description too is uh where you're sort of making this dichotomy between machines and organisms well i'm trying to burn down the dichotomy Bur- sorry oh uh, yeah sort well, of it's interesting are you thinking about the it's, one where it was talking about the intelligence of machines yeah you, you do make some like specifications right uh where like uh, anastasia says you you're saying that you know organisms are intelligent at all these scales and uh, machines never could be even intelligent, and I've 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 I've, I've never said they couldn't be. I, what I what oh, I really? think I said no, no, I don't think so. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully I've never. There is a heading I'm, in one of the papers that says yeah. machines are not intelligent and never. Oh yes, be. yes, okay. that's because. But but <laughs> yes, yes, but that's because those headings. If you look at all the headings, we are basically what we're doing is we're we're trying to we're trying to demolish the co- the, the 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 typical statements that are made by mm. people. I see, that's I one see, of the I things see. that we're arguing against. All, all of the all of those headings are things that we are but basically the rest of the text is trying to shoot it down i see so, so you're, you're trying to say that the, the, the idea of a machine as we understand it is outdated and that we need to start thinking about machines in different ways here's here's what i think uh th- this a lot of the terminology that people use around this m- machines robots um organisms uh intelligence a lot of these things, the, the the definitions we have now are not going to survive the next couple of decades. They are based on extremely outmoded criteria that are, I mean, look, in, in the olden days, some number of decades ago, you could walk up to something. If you didn't know what it was, you could knock on it. And if you heard a clangy metallic sound, you could, you could know several things. It came off a factory. I'm morally uh, in my rights to do whatever I want with this thing, take it apart, put it in the garbage heap, fine. And it's going to be boring and it's not going to do anything interesting, right? Whereas if you do this and it's sort of wet and, and, and kind of squishy, right? And, 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 you know, sort of like that, then you would say, ah, this, this was evolved on earth. It wasn't designed by, by, a, by a mind. Uh, I better be nice to it. And I can expect some really interesting hijinks, you know, if I, if I have it in my house. So that, th- 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 those conclusions ba- were c- made entirely based on the limitations of past technology. They're not deep. They're, they're just 
to, to, you know, the, the total crap basically at this point. They're not going to survive. Now, now we have machines that that are that are um, des- that are evolved using using evolutionary strategies. There are designed organisms. Um, going into the future, what you look like and what you're made of and how you got here, your origin story, are going to be terrible guides to your moral um, standing and to your cognitive capacity. Mm. They're, they're going to be terrible. You, you will, we will be surrounded. This is this is something I was just writing about the other day. We are going to be surrounded by every possible combination of evolved living material, um, designed uh, artificial materials and software, every kind that you can think of the, 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 the you know, that star Wars cantina scene is going to be just totally tame compared to what, how we're actually going to be living. And this distinction, when people say machines can't do this and mach- if, if you just, if you just push on that a little bit and say, okay, tell me what a machine is, tell me what a robot is. And, and by the way, that definition better be useful beyond like 1960. You know, mm-hmm. it better be a modern definition that that doesn't lean on these ridiculous uh, limitations that are just not even true anymore. Certainly not going to be true in the future. So, so that's yeah. So that's and, and that's if I recall, first of all, I love that you're obsessed with definitions. That's something that we are completely nuts about at demystifying science. And our, you know, we have a Facebook group, and most of what we do is argue about definitions. And so that's awesome. What and I believe you it, just. Before we go any further with that, the machines you define as basically they they have to be useful, right? Is that is that something? That's that's one way to that's one way to do it. Um, I think is so so just to back up a second, here's here's what I think about definitions. Definitions are meant to the 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 reason you want definitions is to facilitate progress. You don't want definitions that uh that that hinder you from from thinking in various ways. And so to me, there are no uh, and this 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 also gets me crazy. Some people will say, "Well, that's just a metaphor," and it's not okay. Everything is a metaphor. There's there's not we don't have we don't have access. At least I don't believe that we have access to any any real objective truth ever. What we have access to are metaphors, which can be good. Or they can be more or less useful, right? So what I, so I'm going to suggest that to the extent that you want to use the word machine, for example, um, <clears throat> it better be a definition that is that is useful in some fashion. It helps you do something. So to me. Right now, a useful definition of a machine doesn't have anything to do with what you're made of or whether you were designed or evolved. I, I think the salient, and, and I'm not saying I have a, the, the best answer, by the way. I'm sure, I'm sure there's plenty of work to be done to get better definitions of all of, of all of this. But I think the interesting thing about a machine is that it's a system that works according to uh, understandable logical rules that's able to be manipulated to uh, for specific outcomes. So now a machine is something that you can, with with sufficient effort and brain power, you can say, okay, I see how this works. And part of seeing how this works is if I wanted to change it to do something it doesn't normally do, here's how I would do that, mm. right? Anything you can do that to, that's that's a machine. So um, I, I also, the other important thing about all of this is that I don't believe in binary definitions for almost anything. So there's no such thing as, I, I don't think, mm. yes, this is a machine, that is not a machine. It, it, there's no binary about machines. There's no binary about cognition, about consciousness, about intelligence. It's never does it or doesn't it. It's always how much and what kind. So if somebody shows me, uh, somebody shows me, um, uh, you know, a, a bacterium, I'm going to say, y- yes, that's that's quite a. It's got many properties of what you consider an organism. It's got quite a few properties of what you would consider a machine. By the time you get to a human, it has some of the properties of the machine. There's a lot you can do with the physiology and the behavior, and there's a, but it's got a bunch of other stuff that uh, really uh, you, it wouldn't help you to treat it as a machine. At least now it wouldn't. Maybe sometime in the future you could. Um, so does context have a lot to do with this then? Like, does a definition need to be set in some place? Like, you know, if I'm sitting here next to a washing machine and we're trying to decide which of the two of us is the machine, maybe one definition would work quite nicely. Whereas if you're comparing me to something that's a little bit more on the edge where you're talking about like an engineered organ or something, it's kind of, you know, a little bit I, I, trickier. I, I, or like yeah, a pancreas I, I, versus I, an insulin pump, I think is maybe I, like a better. Oh boy, uh, yeah, I think uh, I I, th- I think they're they're certainly both kinds of machines. They have different. Uh, the, the, there's some different properties, and and the, the, they're uh, useful in different circumstances. I think it's not just context. I think it's all observer dependent. 
So it's everything to, to me, everything is in the eye of the beholder. It's in the eye of the observer. Now, the observer, by the way, might be the system itself when it looks at itself. We can talk about that in a minute. But but if I, if I look at something and I say, and it's the same thing with seeing intelligence. If I look at, uh, at, 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 at you and the washing machine and my goal is to, I need a paperweight. I need a really good paperweight. I look at the washing machine and I go, that's awesome. That thing, I'm going to set that thing down on my papers. That's not going anywhere. You are a terrible paperweight because you have a tendency to get up and wander around. <laughs> I don't it. like it. So, right? Yeah. So, so that's, so that's one thing. On the other hand, if I want, uh, you know, if I, if I want, um, you know, if I want you to, uh, uh, you know, do, do some kind of useful thing, I'm going to say, this washing machine is very limited. I'm never going to get this thing to like guard my house or do anything else. All it does is this one thing. It's a very boring kind of machine. I, I, you know, you look at, a, at an organism, you say, that that is a much more interesting machine that has all kinds of stuff and and maybe i can get it to do certain things and maybe i can't because it's a it's a it's a kind of machine that is self motivated and at some point you might decide to just leave and then you know uh yeah so it's in the eye of the of the observer all of this but it's just terrifying because does that kind of destroy the, the any chance of defining life itself if we can't really separate machines from organisms well, look, uh, what, what do we really, what useful definition of life do we really have to begin with? If, if you, you ask yourself, if, if, uh, what, what tools do we have when we go to other planets and, uh, or, or synthetic biology, if I may, I mean, already we, people make all kinds of stuff that, that you can have a week of arguments about whether it's, it's primitive life or not. Right. Um, and, 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 and knowing what you find on, you're, you're sitting home one day and a spaceship lands on your front lawn and this, this thing trundles out and it's kind of shiny and metallic, but it walks up to you and it's got this poem that it wrote on the way over. Right. And it's like, look, I I'm, I'm here to meet you here. And you're looking at it. And so now it, what do you have in your toolkit that you're going to say, is it alive? Is it, is it, what, does it have cognition? Was it made by someone? Did it evolve somewhere? We and usually, I mean, we usually start, I mean, we argue about this nonstop with, in our social media and so forth. It's actually one of our favorite topics is what is life. And like the closest we've gotten is something like autonomous intention, like the, some, some expression of intention. Do you, you know, do you, but if, if these machines are going to be capable of goal oriented behavior, then it's like, and it's autonomous to some extent. <sighs> I mean, defining, I, 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 I'm sympathetic to what you're trying to do, but, but I think defining that in a, in a rigorous way is brutally hard. Yes. It right. Is. <laughs> I mean, you your, your, you know, your, your Roomba has autonomous uh, intentions and, well, it's and, been and, programmed by us, but you know, yeah, but, but, but it's not difficult to set up a, um, uh, an evo uh, you know, an, an evolving, uh, algorithm that, that would just would evolve this from scratch. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, I, I don't, I don't find it particularly helpful. I, I don't even know, look, I don't even know that the word life is particularly useful. Mm, that's I, what I was getting at. Yeah. I, right. Like I, I've always had this feeling that the question of what is alive versus what isn't alive is a question of how can I treat this object? Yes, yes, and I 100% agreed. I think I think that is all, that is about that is what all of this stuff is about. I think that that um, w alive is not particularly useful. It, it was useful pre, you know, I don't know, at the turn of the century, it was useful because it was pretty clear that the, 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 you could segregate things into alive and not alive, and that would that would correlate great with how you're supposed to treat things. Kind right? of, really kind of, right? Because if you look at something like the biosphere. It's very hard to look at Earth and be like, Earth is alive. And yet, when it comes down to looking at the turn of the century and you have the Industrial Revolution and you have the consumption of raw materials, there's nothing inherently bad about breaking up a mountain and taking coal or whatever else out of it. But there is something about the extractive process, which if you're able to look at the Earth as being alive, despite the fact that it's this object, you begin to have a different attitude towards the way that you can treat it. And so I'm not sure that it was necessarily possible to easily bin things even a hundred years yeah. ago. I think people did. Yeah, I, I, you, you're, you're right, of course. Uh, I, think, I think you're right. Um, the problem is that alive, we, 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 have a, we have a terrible history of 
um, not using the, the category of alive to dictate proper, uh, proper behavior, right? So we, we farm animals and we, we do all kinds of uh, horrible things to things that we're pretty sure are alive, right? So I think long before you get to worry about whether the mountain kind of ecosystem was alive, we've got questions about factory farming and, and what we do to each other and, and various kinds of things, right? So, so I think alive doesn't really do the trick. In fact, I don't know what it does. I, I honestly don't know of any really great, useful things you can get out of the word alive. I mean, but- here, here's one thing. What about like large scale physics? You know, there's like the motion of, so, I mean, this might not actually be relevant to things on earth, but certainly a lot of people spend their careers trying to figure out why the heck the galaxies are rotating the way they are and things like that. And there's no consideration to intentionality in those processes because we don't consider them alive. Um, I, Might I, matter? Think, I, I think that the question of whether or not there's intentionality there has nothing to do with whether or not or how alive it is. Mm. I think I think there are plenty of things that have intentionality that you wouldn't say are alive, maybe. Again, I don't know what saying that w- when you when you say something is or isn't alive, what does that allow you to then assume? Uh, almost not, as far as I can tell, almost nothing. I guess you could explain something without relying upon Newtonian physics or you know, traditional momentum based calculations, right? You can be like, okay, well, the reason these things don't orbit the way that we thought they would is not because there's an invisible substance there or something. It's just because they don't want to something like that. That's a whole other. So, so that's not about being alive. That's about picking the right level of agency for any given system. And uh, I will say, I have a whole story I can tell about that, but, but basically I think, I th- I th- the, the interesting thing is that I don't think you can, much like with almost anything else, I don't think you can sit back in your armchair and make decisions on what's agential and what's not. You've got to do experiments. So, so for, i just give you a simple example. Um, gene regulatory networks, right? The little, little pathway arrow models that people build all the time. They're like... Uh, the paradigm example of determinism. There's, there's no magic. There's no weird forces. You know what all the genes are. You know what, what you know. You know and, and, and people treat them as, as, as you know, kind of deterministic systems and they work because there's a law. It's, it may not be Newtonian, but whatever it is. Um, and, then, and then a bunch of people, a few, a few groups and, and our lab as well, show that actually they can learn. They have, they have including associative learning, right? So they have a tiny little bit of agency. I mean, it's tiny, it's nano, but they can learn, which means that in your relationship to them, you don't just push things around at the hardware level. You can train them with experience. What does that mean that they learn? Meaning that their future behavior is is, um, uh, altered by their past experiences. I'll give you a simple example of associative learning. You have a a, a pathway, gene regulatory network. You have a drug that causes a particular outcome, right? Right. And what you can do is you can take, and then you have another drug that targets another part of the network that doesn't cause that outcome, right? If you present them together long enough over a few iterations, eventually you can just, pr- you can just provide the second one and you'll get the same outcome. It's Pavlov's dog. Wow. It's right. It's the bell, you know, it's the bell and the, and the meat, right? Because, because the system has that bit of memory that's able to associate past stimuli, remember them and act upon them in the, in the future. Now, Nobody would have said that sitting back in their armchair. Nobody would have said that, gee, you know, I think, I think uh, pathways could be agential. Nobody would have said that. You have to do experiments. And so when you talk about the galaxies, okay, I, I have no reason to think that this is true. However, um, this is something that I was actually last year, I was, ta- I was, I was driving a, c- a couple of astronomers crazy trying to say, could we, could we, could we design a, uh, a galactic scale system of synapses working in gravitational space? Such that such that passages of of masses would 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 deflect certain things that would hold state. They would have memories. Could we make could we make a giant synapse, like a, a, a you know a solar system size synapse? And if we did, and if, if we and and there was something like that, would we know? Could we tell that from the inside? In other words, to me, all of this is an exp- it's a, it's um these are all open questions to be settled by experiment. And you can do experiments. You, how how do you do experiments on this? If you think about the um. Uh, the, I, I call this, uh, in, in, in the paper that just went up uh, on the archive yesterday, I call it the, um, uh, the continuum of persuadability. The question is, how do you relate? And this is exactly what you just said. How do you relate to the system? So, so just imagine this, this continuum. On the left side, you have, you have boring mechanisms like mechanical clocks, right? If, if that's what you're dealing with, then, then you're not going to convince it of anything. You're not going to punish it. You're not going to train it. You just have to rewire the hardware. That is the only way you're going to relate to this thing. 
Then you, then you, you go a little further on the continuum. You have an interesting system like a thermostat. Now, that thing is interesting. You're still not going to convince it of anything. You're not going to punish it, but it has a set point. And what you, what you can do is you can alter the set point and get the whole system to do something different. You don't even need to know how it works, really. All you need to know that it is, in fact, a thermostat. And you need to know how to read and write the set point. You need to know how to, how to change the set point. And then, so that's a completely different way of interacting with the system because it's a goal-directed system. You change the goals and you let the system do what it does best. You don't rewire it. You just change the goals. Go a little further and you've got a rat. And now that system has preferences and it has, it's, it's able to learn from rewards and punishments. Now, you don't need to know how it stores the set points. You don't uh, need to rewire it um, mechanically. You can get it to do circus tricks and all kinds of complex behaviors with rewards and punishments. This is why humans have been training animals for thousands of years without knowing any neuroscience. Why can you do that? Because you don't need to know the, the neuroscience. You, 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 you can relate to it from the level of motivation, not from the level of micromanagement and not the level of set points, right? And then you go further still, and now you've got a rational human and now you don't need even need to do any of that. You can give them a, a logical argument, right? A teeny weeny uh, sort of amount of energy spent. You just say, hey, did you know that X, Y, Z? And now you're completely hands off. You're relying on that system to go, oh my God, you're right. Well, that means I got to, I got to, you know, I got to, you know, work towards world peace or whatever you're going to do. So you can launch this like massive effort on the part of the system. You're not micromanaging it. You're not, you don't know how it sets its, its you know, set points. You're not rewarding it directly. You're communicating logic to it, right? So all along here, you have different kinds of systems. Now, when you when you say uh, the galaxy is spinning, where are they along this thing? I don't know, but I also think it's uh, not a great idea to just pick a spot and say, "I'm sure it's there." You know, problem solved. Right. No, it's all of these things are empirical questions, and and let's just see. They're not. They're not. Uh, it's not magic. It's not philosophy. It's it's science. Let's let's see what is the best system. Um, I love wow. that. Um, I know we've taken a lot of your time already. There's one last thing I really wanted to ask you about, um, which you, you have, I'm going to just read a little quote from this paper. This is the paper you did in Aeon. Uh, is it the magazine, the journal is called Aeon, I believe, with yeah. uh, Dan Dennett. And you say, I'm going to just read this sentence. Thanks to Charles Darwin, biology doesn't ever have to invoke, quote, intelligent, an intelligent designer who created all of those mechanisms. Evolution by natural selection has done and is still doing all that refining and focusing and differentiating work. When you, when you make evolution an actor, do you think that you're really moving away from the idea of an intelligent designer in that you have a conceptual actor that's not actually a physical entity that's doing? Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a great point. So, so here's what I think we're, we're doing there. What I think we're doing is saying that a designer is not really what you think it is. It's, it's, you can, you can be, you don't need to be uh, an engineer with a pencil behind your ear. That's able to envision all the different things that could happen and, and, and work towards them. That, that's a kind of designer and that's great. There are other much more um, miniature, you know, sort of much more humble versions of that that also produce amazing, amazing pieces of engineering and novelty and, and creativity. And when we say that's not a designer, um, ultimately, I mean, this was a, look, this was a short piece, you know, we can, we can go into all this stuff here. And actually, I don't even know, um, you know, if, if Dan would, would agree with everything I'm saying here, but I'm just going to tell you what I think. I think that evolution is not nearly as, uh, as, as dumb and short-sighted as people say it is for a couple of interesting reasons. But I also think it is not so far on the right of that scale where where you could say it has specific um, you know sort of second order goals and it knows where it's going. It's not that kind of designer. But but being I, again, I don't like this idea of designer being a binary term. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's almost no binary terms that I like, and and I think that being a designer is a matter of degree. And I think evolution is kind of a, a, a small one, still, still quite impressive, actually. Um, but, but, but it's not the kind of designer that you would want to, from a human or, you know, or God or, or whatever. It's not that kind of designer. But it is still a non-physical actor. It's a, it's a process. I mean, what's a physical actor? I don't know. We, we're not physical <laughs> actors either, right? We're, we're sort of metastable whirlpools of the energy moving through, you know, a particular construct, like what's, what's, re what's really a physical actor. I don't know. It's, uh, 
a sledgehammer, I guess, or something. I mean, I think that I think that evolution is a physical actor to some degree because you have these axiomatic principles as to how molecules interact and the outcome of those interactions. Well, evolution is an idea, though. But evolution is also a process which is which is emergent from cells living, doing, getting eaten versus not getting eaten, right? So I mean, certainly the cells are doing something, but. Just, yeah. I mean, but we I, 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 yeah, I, I think I think it's important to to, um, to keep in mind that evolution is is much deeper. It, evolution doesn't have anything to do with cells, really. Right. Evolution. You can do you can do evolution in, in an afternoon on, a, on a, with with algorithms. Uh, you know, that has no, that have nothing to do with cells. What, what's, what's cool about, I mean, the, the evolution that cells do is interesting for other reasons, but the core properties of evolution, this idea that you can do this, this, all, all you need is three things. You need, you need some kind of heredity, right? You need, you need, um, so you need uh, limited resources and you need your heredity not to be perfect. So that sometimes make mistakes. That's it. Those are the three things. And, and what are the three things that that applies to? It can be anything. Mm. It can be, it can be, um, you know, it can be, it can be concepts in your head. It can be uh, engineered artifacts. It can be cells. It's a very generic kind of system. And it has all kinds of interesting properties that we don't, uh, that, that, we, that we can't anticipate, you know, in advance. And, and by the way, when you think of an actual designer, um, we don't have any idea what's so 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 we know how in in science we know how to take something and say don't worry folks there's no designer here here's how it works the revolution let's go the other direction let's take an example of a designer that is non-controversial here's our engineer right and, and she's sitting there with you know the pencil behind her and des- is designing something we say okay what is going on in that case that's magical and different from this other case i mean What's happening in there? I mean, kind of running through some options, right? And saying, okay, these are all trash. I'm going to focus on these four. And well, I kind of like this one. This might, how, how, how much different does that sound than this other, than this other system? Like, I guess just because it's not embodied, right? I guess it's like, it's sort of this disembodied actor, which is very, it's just, it just seems like often to me, like it's not that far off from a deity. Like if you have this n- disembodied actor called evolution that's doing s- stuff like the, but it's, the fact that it has the verb do like it isn't it is, it, it, yeah. it, you know what i'm saying i don't know it's bit, i know i know i know what you mean but I, but but here's here's the thing uh, i think it only seems disembodied because we're looking at the wrong scale mm. so we are at at our scale we're we're teeny tiny beings both in space and time and when we say how in the, where is all this cool stuff happening Evolution is a is a, in fact a, a lineage, you know, fifty thousand years of alligators or whatever, or fifty million years. Um, that is an individual, right? It's a, it's a massive individual. We don't see it. Mm. Every every genome is a hypothesis made in the mind of that individual about what the outside world is like. Those hypotheses, and this is you know from Carl Friston's work on um, on uh, hypothesis uh, t- testing in the brain. Uh, Every, every each one of those hypotheses gets tested. Many of them die because they're, no, they're no good. The good ones, uh, you know, sort of go go forth. We're just looking at the wrong scale. If you if you back off and look at a whole evolving lineage over a massive, uh, you know, time and, and spatial scale, then it's very embodied. Mm-hmm. And you can point to all the things you're used to. You can say, here's where the computation happens. Here's where the hypotheses are formed. Here's where the hypotheses are tested against the world. It looks exactly like. Uh, the modern pictures of the brain with active inference and everything else. So I, I, I just, you know, at, at a different scale, things look different. And and so maybe there's more a more appropriate, more physical term for that meta actor that we just haven't really stumbled upon right now. And so we're referring to the process as the actor in the meantime or something like that. I, I, th- I think actor, like all these other terms, actor is a fine term as long as we understand that it's it's a continuum. So when I say actor, you say, no, no. Do you mean a tiny little actor or do you mean like a human level actor or something in between or something post-human? Like what kind of actor? All of these questions need to be specified with what kind and how much. Right. Right. That's, that's, you know, that, that's my main message is that the binary never helps us out. The binary just makes all kinds of pseudo problems that you can argue over endlessly. And I feel like the scale is part of the context. And I think that's what, what I was kind of trying to get at earlier, but yeah, yep. man, it's been a real privilege to talk to you today. Um, I feel like we have probably taken enough of your time for one slot. Uh, maybe um, you have other things you'd like to do with your evening. We would love to catch up with you down the road after you've done some more sure. work. Very and, much so, yeah. Yeah, thank sure. you so yeah, much. Yeah, I would so be happy much. to. No, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, this was a very fun conversation. Um, great, great questions. 
um, yeah, I'd be happy to happy to come back anytime. Awesome. And everybody, happy New Year's, and we'll see you guys next time. All right. Take it easy. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.